Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to my talk entitled Information Rich High Throughput Screening with Multiplexing Surface Plasma Residents. My name is Dr. Cyril Brunner. I'm an application specialist at the SPR Excellence Center in Felland, Switzerland. I joined Brugger in 2020 after pursuing my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences as ETH with the focus on biophysical assays in rock discovery. Today, I will guide you through a few topics regarding our new SPR platform. First, we look a bit into the basics of surface plasma resonance for those who are not so familiar with the technology. Then we will go look into the working principle of the SPR Pro platform before we go into reproducibility and sensitivity of the system, as well as then three example cases looking at multi-target assays, first selectivity assay with small molecules, then um, some multi-target screening assays, two of them, with small molecules, a smaller one and a larger one into a more high throughput screening and eventually the summary and your questions. First, we look a bit into the basics of SPR for those who are not so familiar with the technology. SPR is a biophysical technology to assess the kinetics of an interaction. So when two binding partners interact with each other, they uh, do this at various speeds. There is an association, so part when um, the complex is formed, this is annotated with an association rate constant called Ka, as well as the falling apart again of um, the complex, which is done over the kinetic rate constant Kd. This is the dissociation rate constant and the association rate constant. SPR now measures um, an interaction based upon a change in the refractive index of a protein that is immobilized on a sensor surface, to put it a bit in short. If an analyte binds to a protein, then there's an immediate change on the sensor surface, which is recorded. So the incident angle of light that is shined on top upon the sensor surface is changed to some extent, which results then here in the change of the response, giving you a different um, response and thus a sensor graph. The question is always why is kinetics relevant? Most of the assays that we perform are equilibrium based, so they measure an interaction at a single point in time. This makes affinity then a static parameter. However, if you look at these two examples, both are compounds binding with an affinity of 100 nanomolar. The first compound has a complex half-life of one minute. The second one has a complex half-life of 11 minutes, so factor 10 um, larger complex time. This can be highly relevant in certain biological applications. Here are two examples. On the one hand, the neutralization of SIV is highly dependent on the off rate. So uh, the longer the complex stays together, the more likely it is that SIV is neutralized. Similarly, the inhibition of PSCK9 is also guided by the off rate. Other examples would be in radiopharmaceutical sciences, where the off rate can be very decisive of whether a compound gives a good signal to noise ratio with its background. With that, we come to our new SPR Pro platform and how it actually works. The system is an eight flow channel system, as you see here, with either three or four sensor spots rows. This gives it overall 24 or 32 sensor spots. Each spot, uh, each flow channel is individually addressed by a needle, so you have eight different samples that you can test simultaneously. It's an SPR imaging system, so it requires an, a good imaging um, device. We use here an acousto-optic deflector coupled to a bright light source, which shines then a light on top upon um, the sensor surface, joined together with a high-speed camera that allows us to both be highly precise with a baseline noise of 0.02 RU and at the same time have a high detection rate of 6 Hz, meaning six, sense, six measurement spots per second. The whole setup has a dynamic range of 40,000 RU. The microfluidics of the system is made up in such a way that we are wealthless meaning you can easily use also crude samples. There are no parts in there which um, typically fail after some shorter time. The fluidics has been optimized in such a way that you have a fast transition from buffer to sample as well as back from sample to buffer, giving you also the possibility to easily analyze compounds which have a fast association and dissociation rate.
The reason why we can do this setup in a wallflesse manner is that we use hydrodynamic isolation as our working principle. You see here the setup, a measurement spot. Then there's a buffer inlet, which gives you a continuous buffer flow. Um, there's a sample inlet. And when the sample is injected, it is actually guided within um, the whole flow cell by the buffer stream. So the buffer stream basically acts like a guiding rail. This helps to prevent any usage of valves. And then you have an evacuation port here where the whole sample is then taken away. This is done for every sensor spot here. So you have, you see here below, before and after each sensor spot, uh, you have an according inlet and an outlet. This allows to address each sensor spot row um, individually or together, um, as you see here, or three of them. Um, but it also allows you to address each single spot um, individually by also turning off certain needles. So you can deliver your sample if you want to, to a specific spot like 60. There are multiple assay formats which can be done on our system. The classical one would be the multi-injection cycle kinetics, so where you make multiple injection of increasing concentration of your analyte. This can be done in two different ways. The one way would be here with up to eight analytes. So each flow channel has a different analyze, analyte versus two to three targets. Alternatively, you can bring up to 31 targets on your sensor and inject one analyte. This would be a typical example that is used for biologics where you have um, 31 antibodies immobilized by a capture approach and send over one antigen. This here would be more the small molecule world. Then there's a faster way of doing this with the titration cycle kinetics approach, um, also known by some with single cycle kinetics, where you make, um, let's say, five injections out of those five injections. All of them have an association, but only one has a dissociation, the last one. This gives you um, insight into kinetics in a massively faster way than with a MIG assay. Alternatively, we have then the SIG assay format, where you have um, eight flow channels, each flow channel having a different concentration. So you make a dilution series over your eight flow channels, you inject one analyte against two to three targets. So you get within one injection, um, two to three kinetic characterizations of a compound. An important aspect of any SPR system is reproducibility and sensitivity. We first looked into the reproducibility of our system um, with immobilizations. The first example that I would like to show you here is amine coupling. Um, we use six carbonic anhydrases, um, with each car carbonic anhydrase being immobilized on four sensor spots at 20 micrograms per ml. And you see here at the percentage CV um, that we are below 4% CV with the exception of carbonic anhydrase one, um, but still below 10% for all of them. The second approach would be the FC tech capture that we also used a very common way of immobilizing antibodies. We had a protein AG sensor, therefore uh, measured this with four sensors. And overall, we get a percent CV that is below 4% um, for each sensor spot row. So for all sensor spots A, B, C, and D for four sensors. And the last one, also very common capture approach, biotin tech capture. There I was uh, measured again on again multiple sensors. This time it was three. So we show you here the full range. Um, for each sensor spot row, we are somewhere between four to six, seven um, percent CV overall, five to six percent, um, seven percent CV. Besides immobilization, the reproducibility in a kinetic assay is obviously the most important aspect for SPR. So we looked at that with uh, two oligo pairs interacting with each other. The first one has an affinity of approximately 900 picomolar, the second one in the range of 30 nanomolar. We start with the more affine one. Uh, you see here, that would be an example sensorgram here, that we are below 10% CV for all kinetic parameters, so for Ka, um, Kd, as well as for the affinity Kd. Um, both on every sensor spot row, it is here, as well as on um, the total, so over all 24 census spots in this case. One be acting then as reference. 
Second example with um, a less feed one, so with 29 uh, nanomolar in affinity, we have also less than 10% CV for each individual spot row, as you see here, as well as in total, we are clearly below um, the 10% threshold. A second important aspect for an SPR system, especially when it wants to be used for small molecule research, is its sensitivity. Therefore, we tested two DNP modified amino acids against a really large protein, in this case, an antibody. These DNP modified have a molecular weight of 24, uh, 20, uh, 280, 240 Dalton against an antibody of 150 kilo. Dalton. Why is that important? While well, the lighter a compound is, a lighter an analyte is, the less signal it will give, um, especially when the target is accordingly heavy, um, so when the difference between the two of them is very large. Therefore, we decided to go with this example here, um, and we in analyzed the interaction at two different immobilization densities. The first one at 1,000 RU, the second at 6,000 RU. 1,000 RU meaning a relatively low response. We were aiming here for 1 to 2 RU in response, and the second one with 6,000 in the more comfortable range of like 10 to 15 RU. Um, and we actually detected the whole interaction on the 1,000 RU um, immobilization density level um, with 1 to 2 RU in response. So you see the example of DNP valine very easily resolved at up to 1 RU and response and DNP glycine gave a bit more. Uh, we are here about 2 RU in response. This could be easily analyzed. Also, more importantly, actually, um, we, we were obtaining similar kinetics um, at the two um, surface densities. So also at the very low surface density here with a 1000 RU, we were able to detect the interaction at very similar kinetic properties in comparison to the more common uh, mobilization level one would choose for this type of interaction. With that, we come to the first example case, which would be um, a multi-target selectivity assay for small molecules. Therefore, we chose a relatively common case that you would have in lead development. So you would have a fair share of compounds that need to be checked against certain isoproteins, isocyanes, because selectivity is a relatively important aspect uh, when it comes to the therapeutic success of compounds. We want to hit the right target, basically. Um, therefore, we chose uh, an example, a relatively common example, that would be sulfonamides tested against carbonic anhydrase. We chose three cytosolic carbonic anhydrases for this. That would be carbonic anhydrase 1, 2, and 7, as well as three membrane-bound carbonic anhydrases that would be carbonic anhydrase 4, 9, and 12. Our compound panel consisted of 12 sulfonamides with drug-like properties as well as fragment-like properties. So there were some drugs like acetosolamide or, for instance, dorsolamide, as well as more fragment-like compounds like benzene sulfonamide, 4 benzoic acid, um, or also here, um, ethanol benzene sulfonamide. The experimental setup for the uh, experiment was as follows. We immobilized the proteins by amine coupling. Um, one pair of flow channels, so channel 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, 7 and 8, featured all six proteins as shown here on, on, the, on the graphic. And then we injected one compound per flow channel pair. So one compound here, one compound here, one compound here, and one compound here. The assay conditions were um, as following. We had a PBS buffer with 3% DMSO. We performed one buffer reference injection per analyte concentration. Performed the whole assay as a MIG assay format with an on rate of 120 seconds and an off rate depending on the affinity of the compounds between 4 to 20 minutes. The flow rate was 30 microliters per minute. The complete assay took 28 hours to be finished. First, um, a bit of the information about the panel that we chose, because this panel was not only chosen by their um, rock likeliness, um, it was also chosen by the fact that they cover a relatively broad range of affinities um, in, in binding to carbonic anhydrase too. You see this here in, in this table. Um, we have compounds in, in the very 
low micromolar range, um, for instance, sulfonamide or benzene sulfonamide and, and, and CBS. So one micromolar to 100 micromolar sort of um, affinity, typical fragment-like um, compounds, all the way to very drug-like compounds like dorsolamide um, or for instance also acetosolamide being somewhere um, 1 to 50 nanomolar in affinity. We chose then carbonic anhydrase 2 as our um, reference value. So uh, we normalized each obtained affinity value, so KD value, um, against the KD value obtained uh, for carbonic anhydrase and generated this heat map. And this heat map black means that you have an identical value um, between the reference, so CA2 and whatever else protein you have. Um, green means increase in affinity, so affinity gets better. Red means a decrease in affinity, so the affinity gets worse. All those fields where you have a white, um, basically blank space means that no binding could be detected anymore. If you look at this graphic, then you see that there's A, a bit more white, and B, also uh, more red than green, indicating that most compounds actually had a decrease in affinity um, for the other proteins in comparison to carbonic anhydrase 2 binding. When we look at a few com selective compounds, then um, I will want first to look at acetosolamide. Acetosolamide, an approved drug, shows a relatively unselective profile. So you see here, um, that it has relatively little change in, 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 in affinity, very little increase, slight increase, a slight decrease, um, or, or no change over the whole panel. So it's a relatively unselective compound. A more interesting compound is EMAC. EMAC um, shows a relatively clear um, affinity, uh, selectivity for carbonic anhydrase 2, which is consistent with literature reports. Um, it has typically a decrease in affinity for um, other carbonic anhydrases. Different story is U104, again consistent with literature rep um, reports. We see that it has a certain selectivity um, towards carbonic anhydrase 9 and 12, so the affinity is increased in comparison to the binding to CA2. Now the interesting part of SPR is that we can look not only into the affinity, but also how these compounds bind them differently. So whether they bind faster, whether the complex dissociates faster, and so on. When we look again at those three compounds um, and look at acetosolamide, we see that there's a relatively little change happening in comparison to the binding to carbonic anhydrase 2. So minor um, increase for these three amino uh, for these three carbonic anhydrases uh, also for qca1 um, minor decrease in the association that looks different for emac for instance um, there's a yeah, minor change for um, two of them um, also here but then a relatively major increase in the on rate for uh, carbonic anhydrase 4. U104 has a bit of a change or substantial change actually uh, in the on rate for carbonic anhydrase 9 and 12, explaining some of the selectivity um, aspect to it. When we look at the dissociation rate constant, so KD, um, then we see that um, acetosolamide again has relatively little change um, happening. Um, EMAC has a relatively strong change, uh, also decrease in the off rate happening um, for these four carbonic anhydrases, whereas U104 has some minor changes um, happening um, in comparison to the binding to carbonic anhydrase 2. The second example case I would like to show today is the multi target screening that we did for small molecules. Um, normally, screens with SPR are in the smaller range. We talk 100 to 1,000 compounds. Um, and then it's also very interesting to actually already include off-target uh, or off-targets into your screen. The example that we took here is the LOPEC library, which we tested against three carbonic anhydrases. That would be carbonic anhydrase 2, 4, and 12. The LOPEC library is a library containing 1,280 pharmaceutically relevant compounds. 
um, binding to a multitude of target classes, relatively broad um, library containing FDA approved drugs as well as pharmaceutically relevant structures. The experimental setup was um, relatively similar to before. Um, however, this time we only had three targets. So there was one protein per spot row um, and mobilized by amine coupling and then one compound per flow channel pair. We used again buffer uh, one times PBS with 3% DMSO. Then we had one buffer reference per five analyte injections. It was a single concentration screen at 50 micromolar with an on rate of 120 seconds and an off rate of five minutes. Flow rate was again 30 microliters per minute. The whole assay took us 44 hours to measure 1,280 compounds, including controls. As a control substance, we choose acetazolamide because it shows a relatively similar binding behavior over all tested carbonic anhydrases. When we look at the responses that we got for acetazolamide over the course of the experiment and compare it to what response we would have expect based upon the mobilization level, then we see that in the beginning, um, the response stay relatively stable for all carbonic anhydrases. However, towards the end, there's a bit of a loss um, in, in activity of the protein um, observed that you see here. We obviously then took this into consideration while analyzing the data. As binding criteria, we chose um, two criteria. So on the one hand, we choose the response in itself, so the normalized response, that means the response normalized by the molecular weight of the compound, um, had to be higher than uh, the normalized response for acetazolamide divided by two for carbonic anhydrase two, and for the other um, two proteins, we choose then uh, three as the denominator, so we're a bit less string, uh, string in there. And the second criteria was the ratio of the response measured at 180 seconds after injection start versus the response after 105 seconds. Why that? 180 seconds, that's within the dissociation rate already. 105 seconds is still in the injection phase, so in the association, we basically measure the change in response um, after one minute dissociation time, and that should have been the ratio larger than 0.25. We lost six compounds due to insolubility, so we ended up with 1,700, uh, 1,274 compounds being tested. Um, there's a relatively small portion which actually fulfilled um, both criteria, so both the response as well as um, the ratio between on rate and off rate. Um, and uh, however, there was a relatively large number of compounds which fulfilled at least one of these two criteria. So for carbonic anhydrase, for instance, that was almost up to 40% um, of the compounds showing so much. When we look then at the Venn diagram or the interaction, we see 34 compounds were actually bind, bound by um, all three carbonic anhydrases with some others um, being then more restricted. We took these hits and selected them a bit further based upon chemical uh, aspects. So whether these compounds were salts, whether those compounds um, showed some additional binding behavior, also visual inspection of the sensor grams um, to exclude some of the compounds and ended up with a slightly changed uh, analysis of, of binding ones and non-binding ones. So there were then 14 um, compounds which actually were bound by all three of them. Interesting are, for instance, these uh, 20 here. Out of these 20, these are the ones which were only bound by the membrane-bound carbonic anhydrases, so they showed some selectivity over carbonic anhydrase too. Um, we analyzed them a bit further, kicked out those compounds which were uh, more, well, which were amino acids, salt-like, so not really something that could be pursued um, in, in a medicinal chemical way um, eventually, and then ended up with a hit list of compounds. All of these were non-sulfonamides, interestingly. So none of them had this typical non um, sulfonamide characteristic. Um, out of these, we then actually had four of them which showed a relatively favorable binding profile in, in the SPR. Um, so teofitine, for instance, or also here this compound, a relatively um, good off rate 
and also more importantly quite some selectivity in comparison to carbon carbonic anhydrase 2 here the red curve see a different increase and quite a change in the off rate um, also what is interesting with these type of experiments you can look a bit more into certain medicinal chemical um, aspects so we had a bunch of sulfonamides in this low pack library primary secondary and tertiary um, sulfonamides you see here the chemical difference between them when we look at the different um, protein classes or proteins that we tested, um, then we see that primary sulfonamides generally always behaved better. So they had a better um, binding in general. So the mean value of them was better in comparison to secondary and tertiary sulfonamides. Um, they practically showed no binding to carbonic anhydrase 12 and 4, the secondary and tertiary amines, and only some very um, selected secondary sulfonamides showed some binding to carbonic anhydrase race 2. So this gives you then also some medicinal chemical information on the compound class in, in itself. The last case that I would like to discuss today is the high throughput screening um, of such a multi-target screening. Um, normally you have like smaller amount of compounds in SPR but we had some case where we really wanted to push the limit and therefore we went with a screen of 10,000 compounds which in the world of SPR is pretty much considered as a high throughput screening. We tested this against three targets um, and what ought obviously comes then into play is automation. You need automation both in the assay as well and in the, in the analysis. Yes, in itself, it's easy to do because our system has an open design, so you can couple it with a scheduling environment or also with an external plate robot, which easily extends your uh, plate capacity. In the case of this robot that you see here, up to 24 plates. But you also need some automation in the data analysis in order to be able to process this large amount of data in a reasonable time. And therefore, we had a partnership with um, Gene Data and their screening software called Screener. Um, also because our data format has an open interface, so to speak, so uh, the software in itself, Gene Data software, was able to grab our um, data and process it easily within it. Experimental setup was identical to the case that I showed you before. Again, one protein per spot row, one compound per flow channel. But a buffer with 2% DMSO was a single concentration screen of 180 micromolar at an on rate of 45 seconds and off rate of 45 seconds. Six 384 well plates were measured in 24 hours. The whole set took about four to five days um, with 28 384 well plates being measured. More important aspect here is the automated data analysis. Um, our analysis software has a direct interface with the gene data screener software. Also, our data format in itself is open in such a way that it also delivers some information, like for instance, the mobilization level directly into the gene data screener. So you could easily take one file and process it in the automated workflow that the gene data screener provides you. And this basically then cut down the whole data analysis from days, let's say three to four days, um, to a few hours, uh, all because there was an automated way of doing this in the gene data software and from our side, from our data file, all the information that was necessary to perform normalization, to perform um, a response versus uh, a reference response and so on and so on, was easily analyzed uh, by that with a few mouse clicks. With that, I would like to conclude my talk and quickly summarize it. I showed you that our system has a 8x3, 8x4 array sensor spot um, on it. It has a state-of-the-art detection system, being able to resolve also very low responses. It has a wolfless microfluidics design with a high reliability and especially throughput optimized with reprodu giving you reproducible results as I showed you in the oligo interaction. Um, this design allows you to do multiplexing in screening, so you are able to measure multiple analytes against multiple targets. This gives you um, an enriched quality in your screens, giving you additional binding information against other targets, maybe off targets, mutants, whatever you would like to know. Um, and 
based upon our open design, both on the system being able to be coupled with an automated system or a scheduling environment, as well as the open design in our software and the data format, um, which allows then on the other hand, integration with an automated data analysis stream, as I showed you with this uh, gene data screener software. All this joined together is then able to give you multiplexing at a high throughput level for all of your assays. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm now open to questions. Thank you.